Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 185. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy and co-founder of Lend at Fintech. Today's podcast is sponsored by Experian's Clarity Services. They are the leading subprime consumer credit reporting agency, providing innovative risk management solutions to address the full consumer credit lifecycle. Clarity leverages the combined power of the largest and most comprehensive alternative credit data source with traditional bureau data to provide a more complete view of a consumer's financial behavior. Clarity is committed to providing products that address rapidly changing market conditions. You can learn more by visiting clarityservices.com slash solutions. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Jeffrey Myler. He is the CEO and founder of Marlet Funding, also known these days as Best Egg, which is their consumer-facing brand. So I wanted to get Jeffrey on the show because we've never had him on before, and you know, Marlet has become one of the one of the true leaders in the online lending space. And as you'll see in this episode. You know, they've really done things that, uh, that no other platform has done and have built themselves a, a very strong brand in the industry. So we talk about their loan performance, talk about profitability. We talk about Jeffrey's perspective on the entire online lending space. You know, we talk about the investor side of the business and what's in store for 2019. It was a fascinating interview. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Jeffrey. Hey, thank you, Peter. So uh, I'd like to get these things started by giving the listeners a little bit of background and some context. Uh, you've, had a, you've had a pretty interesting career to date, Jeffrey, so why don't you go through and give us some of the highlights? Sure, I, I'd be happy to. My background, and importantly the background of my colleagues at Marled, is, is a bit unique in the online lending space. Myself, my leadership team, and actually, the overwhelming majority of the folks at Marlette have backgrounds in consumer finance and banking. So in the context of the online lending industry, we're a bit more thin than tech-weighted from an experience standpoint. Now, I specifically have 25 years of consumer finance and banking experience with seven years actually spent in the UK and Europe, but the majority of the time in the US with a focus really on unsecured consumer lending. And, and in fact, as, as you may know, many of us at Marlette worked together in the US credit card industry. Mm -hmm. If you look at my leadership team, six of the nine people have known and worked with me for over 14 years. If you look at the broader strategy staff, about 60% of us have worked together previously. Wow. Yeah, no, it, it's pretty unique. So is that, is that primarily at, at, at uh, Barclay Card or is that, is that what the yeah, majority? Yes, that, that, yeah, yes, it is. Let me give you more color for that. What is really unique is Yes, it's at one issuer, and what is special and has been unique for us is the nature of our shared experience. We collectively had the experience of building a U.S. card business from a billion dollars to $12 billion from a portfolio standpoint in five years, making it a top 10 card issuer. Hmm. And the team, the team that is at Marlette, built the prospect database, the credit models, value propositions that enabled the success of that credit card business. And as you can imagine, that was great context for what we've done at Marlette. Right. Yep, for sure. For sure. So then let's go back just a few years to the, the, to the founding of Marlette, what was it that you saw and what, what, why did you decide to, to start a, you know, an online lender? Hey, that's a great question. We, we incorporated in August of two thir 2013 and then 
launched in the middle of March in 2014. And there were really two things that really informed our thinking about starting Marlette. The first was we clearly saw that consumers were not being served and appreciated the size of the total addressable market. That was the first thing. The second thing was we saw an opportunity to take a different approach than the current incumbents. More thin than tech, more focus on credit and capital markets than on growth in isolation, better alignment of tensions across the capital stack, and more focus on building a resilient personal owned business that reflected our recession tested team's experience in the credit card industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So then um, before we move on, I, I've just, I've got a strange question for you. So, you know, I, I noticed that your, your email address recently changed from Marlet funding to bestegg.com. And what is your company name? What are you, what are you going by these days? <laughs> Great question. Um, <laughs> Peter, the, the, the company is, is, is still named Marlette Funding, but our lending platform and what consumers recognize is Best Egg. Right. And we found, uh, to your good point, that many of our corporate relationships were not connecting these two brands. So over the past two years, we've made a concerted effort to increase awareness and the connection between the two brands. And that's hence why we made the email addy change, trying to connect the two brands so that there isn't that confusion out there. But a, a, a fair question. So but the Marlette brand isn't going away? You're just sort of aligning more with the Best Egg brand? I wouldn't preclude us embracing more and more as time went on the, the Best Egg brand. Okay. Where did that name come from? Right. What's what's the um, what's the the origin of of Best Egg? Sure, sure. So the origin was really part and parcel of the thinking about the customer that we wanted to serve, and when we really analyzed who we were going to be working with, who we were going to be helping here, it was a typically a consumer that is 46 years old. Uh, it is an individual that has liabilities that exceed assets and they're carrying typically, you know, 15,000 plus in credit card debt and they're looking to make a change. And the, the theme for a lot of these people's that people, as we talked to these consumers was the desire the aspiration to uh, have a nest egg. Mm -hmm. and so it was a bit of a play on words. Well, you know, you don't have a nest egg, get a loan from best egg right. <laughs> and you know, start on your path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. Makes sense. That makes sense. So then uh, you know, you've talked a little bit about this, but I, I, I want us to delve into it a little bit more. And like the background of Barclay Card, you know, Barclay Card obviously in Barclays is a, is a very well-established, uh, dare I say, old British bank that goes back yeah. centuries. How did your time there influence what you've been doing over the last, particularly when it comes to, you know, how you sort of made it, built a successful company? How's, how have your learnings at Barclay Card helped you do that? I think that's a great question. And to your point, you know, Barclays is, you know, a couple hundred year old uh, institution and to have folks come from there and, you know, go and do a startup it, it isn't necessarily the logical expectation. But the thing that was unique was Barclays had purchased a startup in the U.S., something called uh, Juniper. And that was the entity that I referenced earlier that the team grew, you know, rapidly. And so, so really Marlette is leveraging that specific experience. It also though, from a, a 200 year old bank perspective, I think there are some things we borrowed from there also. 
I think the compliance discipline, the credit practices were things that we took from Barclays and embedded in Marlette very early on. And both of those specific things had a level of maturity that exceeded the maturity of the company itself. Mm -hmm. Right. Got it. Okay. So... So then now when you, when you look at the competitive landscape today and you, know, you, you see there's obviously there's, a, there's more personal loan offerings for consumers than there probably has ever been, certainly in the last uh, couple of decades. So I'm just curious about when you're looking at the landscape and you've got, you know, you've obviously got all the other online lenders, but now you've got banks coming in as well. How are you differentiating, you know, Best Egg from the other offerings that are out there? Hey, that's a super relevant question. As you know, Peter, the most successful players in the online lending space are those that deliver a fast, frictionless customer experience. And we spend an inordinate amount of time, energy, and focusing on that. In the context of you know 2018 specifically, we introduced new funnels from a customer standpoint, one that is focused on a, a better experience for those people using a desktop, and one is focused specifically on those customers that are using a mobile device. Mm -hmm. Those efforts in 2018 resulted in us having a net promoter score of 68, an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, and a 9.5 out of 10 trust score from Trustpilot. And I think that that's going to be the key, that focus on the customer is going to be the key to differentiate and win in this space. And I think that segmentation and personalization is something that specifically in 2019, we're going to make a lot of strides in. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll delve into that a little bit more in just a bit, but... I want to talk a little bit about your 2018 and you know the scale you guys are at. I know you you, you just recently crossed another another milestone. So tell us how big is your loan book today? So to your point about milestones, uh, as we came to the close of 2018, we crossed uh, the seven billion mark. So in in less than five years, have originated seven billion dollars. As far as the outstanding book, uh, the outstanding portfolio is about half uh, the total origination, so circa three and a half billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And so then, when you look back at 2018, then you know, we're recording this in the middle of January, so you, we, you've you might not have closed out your books yet, but I'm sure you've got a very good idea of of how it went. Why don't you give us some, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, I'm interested in profitability, in, in growth, and, and that kind of thing. Hey, happy to share. And to your point, it's, yeah, unaudited financial results at this point, but happy to share those. So 2018 is the second consecutive year that the company has achieved GAAP profit in the double digit millions. And year on year, we had about a 60% increase in profits. Q4 specifically, Q4 of 2018, marks the seventh straight quarter that net income has been positive on a gap basis. Now, turning to loan originations, 2018 was robust uh, for us also. Originations increased 27% year on year. Okay. Okay. That's, uh, that's a pretty impressive performance. So I, I want to go back to the, the, this profit, uh, the profitability. It's great. You've sure. had seven, seven consecutive quarters um, of profitability. But, you know, we look at the many other the, the companies in this space, and it's, it's definitely been a knock on the, on the space for the last few years where, you know, there's been a lot of venture, venture capital money being thrown at the online lending space. And profitability has proven elusive for, for many players and you know also we don't have we don't have publicly available you know books for everybody but we there, there are for a few players and so I'm curious 
What's your take on that? I mean, obviously, you you, you monitor your, comp- your competition closely, I'm sure. Why is it so hard for for many companies to make money? Hey, that's a, that's a, that's a, another good question. I think new business paradigms that are challenging well entrenched incumbents, in this case, the, the banks, always struggle to be profitable. Now, specifically, if we look at the online lending industry, I think that near term profitability is also linked to where you are positioned on the fintech continuum. Before 2016, I think it was generally more acceptable for the incumbents to pursue growth versus profitability in isolation. Mm -hmm. This is more commonly accepted in the tech space. For example, how many years did Amazon lose money? Right. IPO was in 1997, and in 2009, they were still in the red. Right. What happens in our industry is in 2016, it became abundantly clear that tech was important in delivering a frictionless customer experience, but credit performance, access to capital, and profitability were more important, and the pendulum had swung to fin versus tech. Right. Right. And I think those those players that were more skewed to fin, like Marlette, had an easier time migrating to profitability and acclimating to the new consensus sentiment about the nature of the online lending industry. Mm-hmm. So is that something that you that you consciously made the decision? Obviously, we know 2016 was a difficult year for uh, for many companies in the space, and you know, I wouldn't say funding dried up completely, but it certainly was a lot more difficult. So was that a conscious decision back then to say, right, we need to batten down the hatches and focus on profitability? Yes, that was. Uh, I would say in general, we were always skewed from an orientation standpoint to be more thin than tech. But post-2016, it became clear that we couldn't wait to get to profitability. And at the end of the first quarter of 2017, the last quarter that we lost money, we narrowed the commercial agenda and became a lot more focused on profitability. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. So then let's let, let's talk a little bit about credit performance. You, know, you you've already mentioned that several times and I you know I, I want to get uh, I want to know what color you can give us on uh, on the credit performance of your loan book. So I as you would expect uh, would say we have really uh, unique uh, performance from a credit perspective. We have been really, really consistent in what we've delivered for investors and for the company. And I really think it comes down to this orientation that is more thin grounded than tech grounded. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. For us, quarterly basis, we Job one was always to originate loans that would serve us well and our investors through a recession. And we specifically, on a quarterly basis, target a specific loss coverage ratio. Mm -hmm. And because we target that, we have more predictable and consistent results. In contrast, in contrast, others in the space especially pre-2017, thought of themselves as a marketplace. Job number one was balancing supply and demand for their loans. When demand for loans was high, interest rate to consumers went down and underwriting softened. That approach leads to more volatility and less consistency. And I think that in a large part, that that's been the biggest 
difference. It starts philosophically for how we see the nature of the business that we're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I'm curious about when you, how you view you know, your, 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 you look at your business overall, you, you, you have really maintained a focus on one product to date, the, you know, the personal loan. And you've seen others who have branched out into, into different, you know, different verticals, uh, or just sort of adjacent products, shall we say. And I'm curious about how you view that. Do you, you know, are you comfortable being a, a monoline business for the foreseeable future, or how, how do you how do you think about you know adding uh, a new a new product vertical to your business? Hey, yeah, another great question. Yeah, to to date, we have been totally focused on building a profitable, resilient personal loan business. Having accomplished that, though, in 2019, we will start to take steps to broaden our product palette and leverage the, the platform and the infrastructure that we have built. As you would expect, the first steps are likely, you know, close cousins to the personal loan business, but see over the medium term that we'll go further afield uh, from that. But right. absolutely, Peter, I think that, you know, the time has come for Marlette to uh, diversify. Well, you know, you guys have seem to have a lot of experience in the credit card business. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I wouldn't guess, of course, what your next product would be. But uh, that's, uh, yeah, certainly I know that you guys must, must have, you know, that would be a logical step. I can't comment, but I, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, to your I point, know, I we, know, we, we, I love, know. We, we love credit cards. Right, right. Okay. Anyway, so it's interesting that you guys, you guys are based in Wilmington, Delaware. And I think, I don't know if there's any other fintech companies in Wilmington, Delaware. There certainly aren't many. I don't know of any other in the online lending business. Now, Delaware is obviously a, a, a very, a lot of place, a lot of places have their official headquarters there for, you know, for the various reasons that the government has set up. The state government of Delaware has really promoted that. But I'm curious about, do you think that Wilmington, Delaware, being located there is, is an advantage or a disadvantage to you when it comes to you know, attracting talent to Marlette? Hey, we think it's a huge advantage to be in Wilmington. And to your point, I, I, I don't know if people broadly appreciate that you know, this greater Wilmington area has the greatest number of people probably in the United States with unsecured credit experience. And being in the middle of that has been super helpful for us in scaling the business. I referenced earlier that, you know, 60% of the strategy staff uh, worked with us previously, but even outside of that, the people we've hired have experience in unsecured credit. Now, having said that, we are a fintech player and believe in hiring the right and best people and uh, have tools that enable us to have people work remotely also, if, if that's something that is important to them. But no, being in Wilmington has really enabled us to flourish. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting, yeah. So, and I, I imagine that all the unsecured credit people is because of the credit card companies set up shop there. Is that, uh, is that one of the primary reasons? Yeah, yes. In Wilmington, there's, there's essentially two industries, uh, pharma and uh, credit cards, financial services. And right. to your point, a number of players are headquartered in the area. Right, right, for sure. Okay, so I want to switch to the... Um, the other side of your business, the investor side. And uh, I'm curious about the, the investor mix today and, uh, you know, what, what kinds of investors uh, are buying loans and, and is, that, has, is that changing at all? Hey, yes, that has changed greatly over the, the five-year period that we've been in business. In the, in the very early days, we were funded 100% from hedge fund money. Mm-hmm. That's not, not the case today. 
I, I, I wouldn't quote specific uh, mix percentages, but would say that as we've built a, a, a track record and shown consistency, we've been successful in migrating, you know, over time to buyers, loan buyers, whole loan buyers with lower and lower costs of capital. And that has been really helpful and fruitful and has been, you know, a part of our migration to profitability. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. That makes sense. So, so then on that, um, you know, we, you know, if we did uh, have a couple of years ago, we had your head of capital markets, uh, Karan and uh, Josh Tondry's on the show. And we talked a lot of, quite a lot about securitization. And I won't, I want to go into too much depth, but maybe, uh, and I will obviously I'll link to that show in the show notes. But we, you, know, you have become, you know, a, a, a quite a prolific securitization issuer. You've your deals uh, seem to attract a lot of uh, a lot of attention. So maybe you could just give us an update on that. And uh, do you plan to sort of keep this the, the similar rhythm in 2019 that you that you've established? Yeah, Karan, who who you referenced, has done a great job in developing our securitization program and our deals have been well received in 2018 specifically we did 1.7 billion in transactions bringing the total marlet issuance to date to 2.9 billion furthermore in 2018 a number of the tranches from 2016 2017 and 2018 received uh, rating upgrades from Kroll. As we look to 2019, you know, market conditions permitting, <laughs> we'll continue to be uh, a serial issuer of securitizations. Right, right. Okay. Okay, well, we're running out of time, but I want to, last question on, on 2019 and the future, and you've already touched on some of these things, but, you know, I'm, I'm curious about what, what you're excited about when you look ahead to this year, what, uh, what are some of the things that uh, you want to accomplish? To your point, Peter, we, we've touched on some of this, but, you know, as we enter 2019, it, it's really going to be about capitalizing on the robust and balanced performance that sets the stage for continued growth and product expansion. As you would expect, we closely monitor all conditions that may impact the business and are prepared to recalibrate uh, if, if necessary. But right now, right now, we remain optimistic that we can continue to expand our business at pace, both within uh, personal loans and outside of personal loans. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, on that note, we will leave it there. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show today, Jeffrey, and best of luck to you uh, in 2019. Hey, thank you, Peter. Okay. See ya. You know, the online lending industry is certainly maturing and, you know, I think Jeffrey sort of brings on some of those points there where, you know, they're a profitable business seven quarters in a row. I think that's extremely important. And, you know, gone are the days, you know, if you look back to 2015 where money was just being thrown around, you know, anyone could get, could, could raise capital and, you know, there was certainly no focus on profitability or very little focus on profitability back then. And today, this is, this feels like a different time, 2019. You know, you really, if you don't, if you're not, if you're not profitable or at least have a, a really easy or strong pathway to profitability, you know, you're, you are in serious trouble. And I think, you know, companies like Marlet are showing the way where, you know, you can make money in this industry. It's, uh, you know, e even as a monoline uh, company, they, they have proven that uh, it's, it's certainly doable. And, you know, I think, the rest of the industry needs to needs to take note of that, and I'd I'd like to think that by the end of 2019, you know, the vast majority of, of companies in the industry will be profitable. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening, and I'll catch you next time. Bye. Today's episode was sponsored by Experience Clarity Services. Clarity's suite of FCRA-regulated reports and predictive scores yields significant insight into a consumer's financial behavior throughout the alternative financial services industry. Clarity delivers data-driven risk management solutions that address prospecting, credit evaluation, 
fraud detection, portfolio management, and collections. You can learn more by visiting clarityservices.com slash solutions.